No? <laughs> we're good, okay. So we're gonna talk about a day in the life of a security analyst. So I'm curious how many people here, I wanna get an idea of the audience. So I wanna know how many people are already in cybersecurity and how many people are either getting into it or just starting out their career. So if you're getting into it right now or just starting out your career, raise your hand. Couple, good, good. This is a good one for you. If you've been in cybersecurity for a while, raise your hand. Okay, that's everybody. I, if, some, if somebody didn't raise their hand either time, I was gonna be like, why are you here? This is a strange one for you. Okay, so um, in cybersecurity, there's three main job categories that we talk about. The first one is blue team, which is defensive security. The second one is red team, which is offensive security. And the third one is GRC, governance, risk, and compliance. So those are basically the auditors. So um, a lot of times at events like this, we focus a lot on red team stuff. They'll have capture the flag and they'll have um, presentations about hacking and all, all this kind of red team oriented stuff. But when you look at the number of cybersecurity jobs that are out there, the majority are actually blue team roles. Um, I couldn't nail down the exact number, but it's definitely the majority, potentially as high as 80% of roles in cybersecurity are blue team roles. So I thought it'd be good to have one session that just focus on what do you do as a blue teamer? What's your day-to-day -day look like? What are the tasks that you're doing? It's not all, you know, sitting in a basement with a hoodie hacking the Pentagon or whatever, right? So that's what this presentation is gonna be about. And I wanna give you just a little background about who I am so you know where I'm coming from. So my name is Josh Boyles. Uh, I'm the VP of Cybersecurity and Operations at the Larry H. Miller Company. And I've got a degree in cyber and CISSP and a whole bunch of certs and stuff like that. So I'm kind of a nerd. Um, and uh, you can see I threw a picture of my daughter up there because she's adorable. And a lot of times people have pictures of themselves, but you can see my face here. So I thought that was a better use of the space. Um, so I work for the Larry H. Miller Company, which uh, if you're from around here, you're probably familiar with it. They used to own the Utah Jazz and a bunch of car dealerships. They sold those and now they own a whole bunch of different organizations. So they have platforms, which is that middle row, those yellow ones, and then below that are individual organizations. And I work at the blue level, the top level, right? So my job is to look at all these other organizations and measure how well they're protecting their infrastructure in terms of cybersecurity, right? So we measure and then we also support those organizations. So we'll hire blue team like security analysts that are dedicated to those platforms or organizations that help them out, right? So we have a, a small team that helps out with these. Um, and also, like I said, this is, the intent here is for you to get an idea of what it's like to be on a blue team. If you have any questions, just holler. I would really appreciate some, some interaction. Um, so the main thing that we're gonna talk about is the day-to-day -day tasks. So we've got responding to alerts, project work, being a subject matter expert, and studying. And I'll go in depth into each one of these things. Um, the first one is responding to alerts. So our cybersecurity analysts spend a lot of their time looking at, like on this graphic, I hate having to turn around like this. I'll gesture behind me. On the graphic back here, you can see some of the systems that we use to protect our infrastructure. So we've got like vulnerability management, endpoint protection, IPS and IDS, all those feed into a ticketing system and then the cybersecurity analysts will get those alerts and then they have to research them. If you've worked on a help desk, you know that you'll get a ticket and you'll work on it for five minutes and then move on to the next one. It's not like that. Typically what we do is we have to figure out if it's a legitimate alert, we have to confirm it ourselves, we have to do some more research around what else it could be impacting. So we get that ticket, we research it and see if it's legitimate, we'll pass it on. So for example, like vulnerability management, we'll scan our website and we find that there's a misconfiguration in WordPress or something. So we'll confirm it ourselves and then we'll send that work on to the developers and say, hey, you need to fix this configuration. They'll do it and then they'll send us back an email and say, we're done and then we have to confirm. So that's a lot of the work, like probably half of their day is spent responding to alerts, researching this stuff, all that sort of thing. The next is projects. So we have several different types of project work and the first is improving technical tools. So what, anyone know the name for this yellow thing right here in an email? Email warning tag, yeah. I don't actually know, so that's the name, great. I always call it a banner. I think that's another name for it. But yeah, the reason that we have this is so that someone doesn't send an email that's from, you know, your CIO at your company with one misspelling.com. Hey, can you wire me the funds, blah, 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 right? So this will catch that 
and it will throw that banner up and someone will say, you're not really the CEO, you're somebody else, you're from an external organization. So we deployed a new email protection suite um, and we had to figure out how are we gonna do this email banner? What's the way that we can do it that's most effective? Because if it's too long, people are gonna ignore it. If it's too short, they're also gonna ignore it. Like what's the right length? So what do you guys think is a good, how do you get people's attention without annoying them? Shout something out, you got something. With a banner, yeah. Like, what, what wording would you use? Trey had some? Um, well, I was going to talk about that. So, we have to rotate the frequency of callers and text and hit them and then try to get that frequency. Um, we'll use words like careful, be aware. Yeah, that's ge rotating is genius. Yeah, that's true. And we have ours set up, you know, it's one of those fancy new AR ones, so it will only do it when it reaches a certain reputation level, right? But yeah, I really like the idea of rotating. And we did the same thing, we, so we got together as a team, one of our team members did a bunch of research into the academics, uh, what, what was available, presented to all of us, and we decided here's how we're gonna do it. So improving tools is a big thing that you spend your time on. So not just like this email tool, but every tool that you use, you learn it and get better and improve the way you use it. Improving processes. So here's another example. If we've got improving technical tools, this is improving the people-based things. So this is, you can't see it very well. On the left-hand side, we have a table that shows the the sequence of events in an incident. So we had a priority one incident where Wi-Fi went down for one entire floor of our main headquarters. And this is, a, so this is a fairly short one. And it just goes down, here's everything that happened, here's who reported it, blah, blah, blah. So anytime we have a P1 incident like that, we do a post-mortem and we collect this timeline. And then afterwards we meet with everyone that was involved and we answer these questions and do this analysis to try and figure out how we can make it so that outage never happens again You'll also notice that the last couple questions are about our incident response plan. So not only are we trying to improve the technical controls around that specific failure, but we wanna make sure that next time we, sorry, next time we're addressing this sort of thing, next time we have a P1, we do it a little better than last time. So improving technical controls, or this is the first project work, improving processes, and then improving documentation is the third one. So this is an example, at B-Sides SLC, I talked about making, writing good documentation, and I used the example of incident response plan. And I talked about our very first incident response plan that we had was delivered to us by a consultant, and it was like 16 pages long. And in the midst of a P1, no one is gonna refer to it. And no one's gonna memorize it beforehand, so it was basically useless for us. So we took that 16 pages and we narrowed it down to three pages and then we tried it like that for a while and it definitely worked better but the, the help desk still had a hard time because they had a lot of turnover. So we narrowed it down to a one page cheat sheet that we just pasted on the walls in the help desk so that they saw it anytime there was a priority one thing, they knew exactly where to look and it was all there for them, right? So a lot of time on the blue team is spent improving your documentation as well. Another thing is you work as a subject matter expert, both within the IT department and with the business. So we've got a bunch of questions and I want you guys to answer them for me. So the first one is a question you might get from a user. Is it okay to store passwords in a shared Excel document? How would you respond to this? No. Okay. Now, like we all know, no is the obvious answer, but how would you respond in a way that doesn't make them feel stupid? What would you say to them? Give them an alternative. Yeah, that's a really good one. Say, we don't want to do that, but we do, like, we pay for a password tool, right? A password manager. Great. That's a good one. All right. Uh, do I really need to restart my computer to install updates? Yes. The answer is yes. How are you going to, but the user that's coming to you, the CEO, this has never happened to me. Our CEO is very tech savvy. But let's say a CEO comes to you and says, I really don't want to reset my computer, man. It's, it takes me away from important deal making I got to do. What do you say to them? Yeah. 
Yeah, that's a good one. Where are you, Trey? Yeah, that's great. Yeah, that's fantastic. So you can reframe it and tell them what, why it's actually good for them if you do it. This is where I like to trot out uh, statistics sometimes. And I'll say, you know, 60% of attacks or more involve unpatched software. So if you just reboot this when you're heading home, when you're not thinking about it, you're reducing our risk 60%. That's pretty big. And then they go, oh, OK. I don't like risk. Nobody likes risk. How much would it cost if we got hacked? This is a, a question I've been asked a lot. <laughs> Users ask me. I don't know. There's, there's ways to estimate it. So one methodology is called FAIR. Um, and there's other organizations that do that. So this is something like when we're reporting to upper management, that's the one question they want. How much will it cost us? They want to see dollar signs. And we need to be able to come back with something that actually makes sense, that's not um, needlessly alarming, but that helps them understand the magnitude of the risk, right? So when you're, in, when you're the subject matter expert and you're interacting with the users, it requires a lot more finesse than you might think. It requires a lot more of those people skills, right? I, that's one of the reasons why I love working on a blue team, is I really enjoy taking complex subjects and helping people that aren't as versed with them understand them. So I really, I really like that aspect of it. Now, IT. Is, is anyone in here familiar with PCI? Couple hands. How, this is a developer asking, how important is migrating off TLS 1.1 for cardholder data transmission? Can it wait until next year? No, you're correct. It cannot wait until next year. So you have to be on 1.2 or above, because 1.1 has all these things, right? And that's another thing where, but in talking to them, you might say, we never want to say just a blanket no. So we would say, it's required by PCI. The fines for not being compliant are this much. If the business wants to pay those fines, then they can do it, and they understand the risk, and also we might get breached. But we want to make sure they understand, right? Why is it important? Why is? Oh, yeah, is that what you would tell them, or are you asking me? Yeah. And we can talk about. Yeah. 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 Yeah, exactly. Thank you. OK. How often should we require that users change their passwords? What do you guys think? Daily? <laughs> You're going to be really popular with the users. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah. Trey, you raise your hand. Yeah. Yeah. 
And that's a good point, that the frequency you should rotate, it depends a lot on the, the sensitivity of what you're protecting, right? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I, I, and that's a great point. OK. So that perfectly segues into the last subject, right? Which is studying. Um, cybersecurity is something that changes on a daily basis, right? And even something as simple as how often should you change your password, you will get one set of answers from one government organization or standard and another from a different one. And the best practices are constantly changing and evolving, right? So if you got your degree in cyber or you got your CISSP 10 years ago or whatever, and then you're like, great, I'm done, I never have to touch the books again, then you're gonna be using outdated information. And the IT department, like the IT operations team will come to you and say, hey, what should we set this policy for for password rotation? And you'll confidently say, 90 days, and it's advice that's 10 years out of date, right? So studying, is a really important part of any cybersecurity person's job, but especially on the blue team where you're a subject matter expert, where you need to provide that information to other people, right? Where you may be the one source in that whole organization that's focused on cybersecurity. So like for our team, we encourage them to do an hour of study every day. Some people don't like that, and they wanna do a half hour once a week, or a half day once a week, which is fine too. Um, and then we provide training materials and reimburse for certifications. So studying, continuously studying is so important. Um, so when we look at what a person on the blue team actually does, I broke it down. So we've got, you know, maybe up to half their time is responding to alerts, sometimes less, sometimes more. Um, and then the rest is broken down between studying, being a subject matter expert and advising other teams and working on project work. And we talked about improving technical tools, processes, as well as documentation. So that's the other thing that's great about working on a blue team is there's this wide variety of stuff that you do on a day-to-day -day basis, right? And some of it is really intense research um, that's highly technical, and then others is just talking to somebody or training an end user, right? Like teaching them how to make a good password. So I really like the variety that you get as a member of a blue team. What questions do you guys have about working on a blue team in cybersecurity or whatever? So we do tabletops every quarter, at least. But if we have an incident where we use our incident response plan and we do a post-mortem, we also do those. So yeah, every single incident. And I feel like those are, I don't know. If we, if we do those a bunch throughout the year, we'll still do at least every six months a tabletop. What else? Uh, you mean like other people I work with or people, the general public? Honestly, I feel like the mystique of cybersecurity is beneficial because everyone goes, ah, that's very complicated. Yes, we should listen, you know? <laughs> so it's not that big a problem, I feel like. But I'm also like, our organization is really supportive and I really appreciate it. Other organizations can be a bit more dismissive. What else? Yeah. yeah. Not as often as I'd like, for sure. And definitely, like, my role leans more towards the GRC, where, where I'm supervising the audits and then reporting on them to the board or whatever, right? So, yeah, not a lot. I do occasionally, what I really like is that I serve as a second set of eyes on most of the stuff that our team's doing. So we'll say, okay, we're looking for a new MDM solution, and they'll write a report and do all the research, and then we get to review it together and actually make decisions. I really like that part. Anything else? No? Okay, great. I think we're right about on time, too. Well, we're a little early. Yeah, uh, this is a great softball question. I appreciate it. Really teeing me up there. Okay, 
this is going to be different. So you, you tell me if you think something different. But like for our organization, all we care about is that you are actively studying to become a junior analyst. So if you have like your Security Plus or Network Plus, and you're working on you know, a CISA Plus, or you're studying for your bachelor's degree, those are the type of people that we hire. And then like, and it's worked really good. Over the past year, we've had three of our team members get their bachelor's. We've had like 14 certifications. So like, we just hire for people that are passionate about it and that are learning, and that's way more important than any specific like credential. But if you want a credential, Security Plus, Network Plus, CISA, Pentest, whatever. Would you say differently? Yeah, yeah, I definitely agree. And yeah, Security Plus just gives you that. Yep, they're interested and they're willing to work on their own. That's that's really important. Any other questions? Yeah. I don't know. I think I'm a weirdo, so. I really, like, I'm happy with my job, and I'm not super looking towards the next step. Obviously, I think the traditional career thing would be, like, a CISO role or whatever, or CISO, or CISO. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Although, I think the risk gets overblown a little bit, because we've got this, like, we see a few CISOs that get, like, held personally liable, and that's, like, three of 10,000. So we, we had a good discussion about this, and I'm part of a CISO group, and they were talking about how as long as you're not negligent, you're pretty well protected, so, which is you know, great for me. Anything else? Okay, I really appreciate you guys' questions. If you want to, feel free to ask me, like reach out afterwards, or add me on LinkedIn or whatever. I'm always happy to talk about it. Thank you.